Now, when I was a wee boy, I was a pretty bad sleepwalker. I'd wake up in the middle of the night having no idea where I was, but at least I had my blankie. Stood in the dark in silence, staring out into nothingness, just about able to make out the wall in front of me. And I'll be honest, it was pretty spooky. You're disorientated, and it takes you a minute or two to figure out what's actually going on. Which brings us to last night, when I decided to stick on the one and only Skinnamarink. And that was the first time since I was a wee boy that captured this exact feeling of being scared in the dark. Except this time, I was all out of blankies. Now, if you haven't watched Skinnamarink, the one thing you might know is how divisive it's been. It currently sits at a dead centre, 5 out of 10 on the IMDb's. It's sort of like the Marmite of Horror. You either love it, or it's doo-doo. And I definitely agree that this movie is not for everyone. A lot of people just want to go to the movies and have a bit of fun, with a creepy monster or a guy in a hockey mask with a big ass machete. And rightfully so, I can understand not wanting to be transported back to childhood trauma, or feeling like you have to bust out the notepad and decipher every shot just to understand what you're watching. I feel like horror has become a lot more abstract and artistic over the recent years. You've got stuff Stuff like Babadook, which is a metaphor for losing a loved one, and the grief and oppression that follows. And stuff like Midsummer, which is presented on the surface as a regular old cult movie, but just below sits a story of grief and finding a new purpose. But whilst these movies are artistic and abstract with their themes, I feel like they're still intended for a wide audience. It's pretty easy to understand what's going on. They have just one foot inside the what the hell is going on, Paul, rather than Skinnamarink which feels like it's dived right in, or is at least up to its gooch. So what is Skinnamarink, other than a goofy sounding word? Well, it's an independent horror movie made on a budget of just 20,000 smackaroos. To put this in perspective, when you convert this from Canadian dollars to British pounds, it's actually less than the average UK salary, and it's gone on to make a couple million, so honestly, congratulations. It's always nice to see independent movies win. But you're probably asking, what's the story? The catch? Well, you see, it doesn't really have a traditional story. At least, not one presented to us directly. You can follow clues, and there's a lot of insinuation of a darker, bigger picture. But what we see on screen for 90 minutes is the story of two very young children. A brother and a sister put through absolute hell as they wake up to find their father has disappeared entirely, along with every window and door into the outside world. Where did they go? The pair are trapped, not knowing what time it is, where anyone is, or what's behind this strange paranormal incident. Over the 90 minute runtime, things get weirder and weirder, escalating from the children sitting around playing, to entities calling out to them, attempting to lure them into the dark of their own home. And you might think, eh, that sounds pretty cool, Mr. Wave, but spirit in the house spooking young kids? I've seen that a bunch of times, you stupid idiot. I hate you. And you know what? I hate your content. But you see, where Skinnamarink manages to set itself apart from others that have come before is in the execution. The way this story is presented to us is unlike anything I've ever seen before. Hello? The filmmakers knew how low their budget is and decided to use this to their advantage. Watching Skinnamarink feels like you're watching a home movie. It's all grainy, it's low resolution, the audio isn't exactly crisp. This movie screams analogue horror, and I can see how all this would throw someone off. Seem like just lazy filmmaking. I mean, we're so used to 4K smooth camera work that naturally, it can be a little jarring when something a bit more retro and low quality comes along. The expectation of movies is that everyone and everything is easy to see, crisp and clear. But analogue horror defies this. It's all low quality and cryptic, nothing is ever spelled out. And this can help to achieve a couple things. First, let's talk about the low quality. 
It makes it feel like you're watching something from the past, a time long since gone. And this can be anywhere from around the 60s, but I'd say most commonly it's the 90s, because that's what today's audience is most familiar with. And the idea is to give you this sense of nostalgia, taking you back to your childhood and making you feel safe, only for the horror to come in and take you out of this safety. Like a VHS screen. Woo! Showing a spooky monster staring right at you. Ooh. It's these two conflicting feelings that make analog horror so fascinating to me. But what about the cryptic side of things? Well, when done right, it can create mystery and suspense. And that's what Skinnamarink excels at. I think this might be the first movie I've seen where you never see the main characters' faces. Hell, you barely see their bodies either. Maybe a leg here, an arm there, but never the face. So you're less likely to make up any preconceived notions and ideas about these two children. They're essentially blank slates, allowing you to place yourself in their shoes as they endure this inescapable horror. And the darkness is made even more terrifying because of the low quality. You can't really tell where the wall begins and the dark void of the hallway ends, let alone make out whether this entity is somewhere in this darkness. And it's not just the quality that helps to make things unclear, it's the filming as well. You see, the camera angles are mostly very odd positions. It'd be like if all my YouTube videos were filmed like this. And again, this takes a while to get used to, but I think it's a smart choice. Because it never allows you to be aware of your surroundings. If I walk you into a room and tell you there's a monster in this room, and you see it, it's scary of course, but you know where the threat is. You know which direction to run, where to keep your eyes peeled. But if I walk you into a room with a blindfold, and not in a kinky way, lead you right up to the wall before removing this blindfold, and then tell you there's a monster in this room, it becomes ten times as spooky. All you can see is the wall a foot from your face. This monster could be anywhere. You don't know where to run, where to look. It builds suspense as your mind races, thinking of every horrible way this creature could look, and where it could be coming from. And this kind of suspense is exactly what these low res, odd angle shots achieve. When we feel threatened, our response is usually to try and gather as much information as possible about this threat, so we know what to do. But Skinnamarink keeps this information from us. And I'll admit, sometimes the shots do go on a bit too long. This shot of the boy playing with Lego lasts for over 20 seconds, and then it goes to a pretty much identical shot of Lego which also lasts 20 seconds. And if I had to say how many shots you could take away from the movie while still achieving the the same feeling and experience, I'd say at least a third. I understand the point is to let you sit in this helpless position for as long as possible, but when it's almost every shot, there were a few points when I thought, okay, I'm feeling that fear now, you can move on already. But where the movie took a step up in enjoyment for me personally was around 40 minutes in. Because up until this point, the children have been trapped in their home with an entity we know nothing about. <laughs> calling their names over and over. It's spooky, but the pair find some sense of comfort and safety in the fact they have each other. Better to be in a nightmare with family than alone. But so far, the entity has just been taunting them. The children also have the TV in the living room, where the two watch the same movie over and over again. And this living room becomes a sort of safe haven, as the house gets progressively darker and darker. The entity's control over the house growing, and so the glow of the TV feels safe, a light in this overwhelming darkness. They even board off this area from the rest of the house, creating these two zones. Help me move the couch, okay? And I really liked this decision because it makes the kids feel like kids. We know that blocking off the rest of the house with a sofa won't really do anything, but it's the kind of thing that might make a child feel safe. Like hiding under the covers from imaginary monsters. And why it feels vulnerable when your leg is sticking out the covers, as if a thin sheet will protect you. But even in this comfort zone, that analogue horror remains, as the movie the pair watch is a retro cartoon, with the royalty-free, old-fashioned sax music playing.
This music loops while those grainy shots of wall, ceiling and floor covered in shadow are shown. The comfort and the darkness clashing, the cartoon itself becoming corrupted, looping over and over before shutting off entirely. The only light left in the house gone for good, and then the entity finally succeeds. It manages to lure the sister upstairs, where her face is stolen and she is never seen again. And this scene, as terrifying as it is, isn't as terrifying as what comes after, as now the young boy is all alone, completely at this entity's mercy as it now begins to play tricks on him. Letting him think he's contacted the outside world through a phone, but this turns out to just be the entity he's talking with. The phone turning into one of those toy dial phones with a face, something many of us likely had in our house growing up. Gravity becomes distorted, and the whole thing begins to feel more and more like a dream, or more specifically, a nightmare. So when we finally get to see more of this entity, it reminded me of experiencing sleep paralysis. Have you ever been that specific level of tired where you're constantly fading in and out of consciousness, on the boundary between asleep and awake? And personally, in this state, elements from my surroundings can find their way into this dream state. So say I'm going to bed and I'm watching It's Always Sunny, <laughs> I'll start thinking about Danny DeVito, and for a short while whilst my brain is running at minimum capacity, I might even believe he's in the room with me. Because of the drawings and the faces I keep in my room, a void might appear and stare right at me. And when I'm half asleep, I don't rationalise this. I just go straight to paranoia and danger. In this state, perfectly normal and logical things can seem like nightmares. Sleep is supposed to be a break, the most relaxing thing you can do. And so when you can't even trust yourself to go to bed, it's a horrible feeling. And that's why this entity made my skin crawl despite only partially seeing it for a few seconds in the entire movie. I feel like nothing has captured this feeling of sleep paralysis better than this brief moment. It's like a walking nightmare. Everything about this entity is barely legible, just a white void, with no eyes and no mouth. And again, I'm not in your dreams, so I can only speak for myself, but I find faces pretty difficult to recreate in memories and dreams because the details are so intricate and its voice sounds like it's being played with a dozen distortions, like a corrupted audio file. <coughs> To me, it feels like we're asleep, and this entity is stood over us in the real world, saying these lines, and as they come down towards us, they become warped. Now, like I said earlier, there are clues which lead towards a bigger picture. The most likely explanation is that the boy is actually in a coma, or suffering from head trauma after falling down the stairs at the beginning of the film. And so all the strange occurrences are things happening around his sleeping body coming into his dream, which is why the darkness slowly becomes more and more prevalent throughout the film's runtime, and why the cartoon and faces begin to fade away. As the days go by with him in a coma, he remembers less and less of his life, until he can't even remember the faces of his own family, or a single moment from his favourite cartoon. Although there are quite a few holes in this theory, this doesn't really explain why his sister is also with him for half of the movie, and why her voice is clear and not distorted. I can't scare the golden girl. Although I do believe the boy falling down the stairs is what causes all this, because they focus on it for too long for it to mean nothing. And with a movie as vague and cryptic as this, you can really go a hundred different ways. But personally, I don't feel like I need any concrete answers to enjoy this one. The way it's made and the feeling it struck into me are what I took away, rather than the story itself. That being said, I do think it would have benefited from being a lot shorter, because as it stands, it's kind of more 
more so a cool concept than a complete movie. I don't think I could show anyone this on a horror movie marathon night, and I don't have any desire to watch it again. I feel like this would have had the same impact on me if it was an hour or even maybe 30 minutes long. But if you're interested in low budget filmmaking or just looking for something a bit different, then I definitely give it a watch. At the end of the day, which side of the love hate scale you sit on is really down to personal preference and taste. A lot of fears come from our childhood, and as kids our imaginations run wild and a common theme with the positive reviews seems to be that the ones writing them experienced some kind of spooky situation in the dark when they were younger that this reminded them of. So maybe keep this in mind when going in, although I'm pretty late to this video, so if you are planning to see this, you've probably already done so. Anyways, thanks for watching this video to the end, I really appreciate it. We're coming close to 20,000 subscribers, which is honestly insane. Let me know what you think of Skinnamarink in the comments, drop a dookie below. Thank you, I love you, goodbye.